Michael Beirut's work is represented internationally and in several permanent collections, including the Museum of Modern Art and the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum in New York, the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and the Denver Art Museum. Mr. Beirut has been active in the American Institute of Graphic Arts and currently serves as a director of the Architectural League of New York and of New Yorkers for Parks. In 1989, he was elected to the Alliance Graphique Internationale, and in 2003, he was named to the Art Directors Club Hall of Fame. A partner in the Pentagram Design Firm, he is also a senior critic in graphic design at the Yale School of Art. He is co-editor of the anthology series, Looking Closer, Critical Writings on Graphic Design, and a co-founder of the online journal, Design Observer. His commentaries about graphic design and everyday life can be heard nationally on the public radio international program, Studio 360. Please join me now in welcoming Michael Beirut. Thank you, but you're not here for me this evening. I make no uh, bones about that and have no illusions. Um, are there, I can't see anyone in the audience, you can keep the house lights down, but there are, a lot, are there a lot of graphic designers here? There are 900 plus people here. Who comes on a... Who comes out on a Monday night to hear some book designers talk? I guess I should do this more often here at the 92nd Street Y. It's a real, real, I'm not, thank you. I, um, it's a real honor for me to share the stage with uh, uh, these three guys, obviously, each one of which is a very special talent, and uh, that's what's brought us all here tonight. Uh, it falls upon me to introduce each of them in turn, as you just heard. Um, I am not going to go through uh, the biographical information, which you may have already had the chance to peruse in your program, where they were born, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, I would thought I'd give a little bit of a, um, uh, personal information about each of them, not, not personal things you shouldn't know about them, but uh, <laughs> personal in terms of what I think of them. Yeah, thank well. Um, we're starting with Milton Glaser. Um, I grew up in suburban Cleveland and uh, was good at art, but didn't think I wanted to be a painter. And I remember, like so many people who became graphic designers, just loving books, loving the feel of books, um, Cheap books, expensive books, any kind of books really meant something to me. Um, and I remember particularly the uh, um, paperback, cheap paperback editions we had of uh, Shakespeare when I was in junior high school and high school. Uh, these were the Signet Classic Shakespeare editions, beautiful drawings on the front cover, a border, exquisite typography on the top. It just all went together so beautifully. And the designer of those books was a guy named Milton Glaser. Uh, those books and some other things made me decide that I was going to become a graphic designer. And I announced this to my uh, parents, I think, at the age of 14 or 15, without ever having met a graphic designer and not really knowing what that meant, but just having read in a book somewhere that uh, if you wanted to do covers like this Shakespeare set cover, that's what you called yourself. So my mom, who's a wonderful person, uh, Christmas time 1974, I believe, uh, went downtown to Higby's department store in Cleveland and asked if they had any books about graphic design. Stupid question back in those days, except bingo, they had one, a book called Graphic Design, in fact, and the book was Graphic Design by Milton Glaser. <laughs> I can still take that, I still own that book, I keep it at my desk. Every time I take it out, it's like uh, Madeline's word of Proust. I can just remember what it was like to have my whole life stretching out ahead of me, intoxicated by these beautiful drawings, beautiful typography, beautiful ideas in this beautiful, beautiful book. Um, and here we are with uh, Mr. Glazer himself, about to come out on stage. Uh, he has a special place, I believe, in the heart of this city, having designed and founded New York Magazine with Clay Felker, but also obviously, as everyone here knows, I'm sure, uh, having been the designer of the I Love New York logo, uh, which is as ubiquitous as a logo as any that exists in the 21st century, I would say. Um, he is, among many other honors you'll read there, the 200, 2004 Lifetime Achievement Award winner from the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. Uh, he brings extraordinary depth to our profession and extraordinary depth to uh, our uh, understanding of how communication works in today's complicated world. I give you Milton Glaser. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Michael. <clears throat> I, I was convinced we would have 30 people here tonight, so this is, I assume there are more out there since the noise level indicates that. I'm very happy to be here, but as I'm fond of saying these days, I'm very happy to be anywhere. So. <laughs> Um, I started doing book jackets a long time ago, and uh, I always enjoyed doing them because it brought together a lot of the skills and interests I have, a love of drawing and uh, admiration of typography, and uh, a great interest in narration of storytelling. And Of course, uh, like many uh, people of my generation and later generation, the interest in narration through pictures and the comic strips is certainly one of the formative influences in my life. But I was not surprised to find that Roy Lichtenstein and, and dozens of other painters also grew up with that same interest and passion. One of the great things about doing book jackets, and I did a lot of them through my life and continue to do them, although not with the frequency I once did, I guess I've done a, a thousand or so, uh, but over a course of 50 years, that's really a slow production compared to Chip Kidd, for instance, who does that many in a season. Uh, but one of the great things about doing book jackets is one of the few areas that your work became observed and that you were credited with having done it, as you may know, and since many of you seem to be graphic designers, uh, it is, by and large, an invisible profession. But one of the nice things about book jackets is you always got a credit at the back and identified as the maker of the jacket, which, of course, was a significant improvement over simply being paid. In those days, you were paid $100 for doing a book jacket, and you had to provide all your own typography, which cost about $7 in those days. So the standards were quite different. Nevertheless, it was always uh, a great joy to, uh, to do them and to go into a store and to see them on the shelf with your name attached to one of the great satisfactions that all of us in the field of graphic design seek. Anyhow, I'll show you some book jackets and we'll run through those examples quickly because I think we're going to have a nice time talking to one another. These are the um, two of the perhaps 30 jackets that I did for the Signet Classic, which I have to say established my reputation in the field of uh, book jacket design. I had a simple-minded idea uh, about it, which came out of the fact that there were five other editions of paperback Shakespeare at the time, and um, it was uh, a primitive era in terms of printing, and everybody was using color in great abundance because color had just sort of entered the field as an element in book jacket design. This was a very long time ago. <laughs> Incidentally, they're still using these jackets, which sounds extraordinary, but uh, if you go into a store, they will uh, have a display of these jackets, uh, but now they package two in a single book, so I must say the result is very unfortunate. Nevertheless, my trick was to use very little color and because I understood something about the nature of context, that if everybody else was using a lot of color, you should use little color. And the effect was really interesting because they would put up a wall of paperbacks. In those days, they would do those by publishing house. So you would enter a store, and there'd be a riot of color in the middle of the store. There would be a white island, and that white island turned out to be these little Shakespeare covers, which were minimal in their use of color. You know, zig when they zag and zag when they zig is the principle. An early cover that I did, and very peculiar, I must say, for, for a wonderful book by Italo Spavo. Um, it was one of the first jackets I did, and I still like it enormously, and I don't think I actually, in terms of the adventure of this cover, would improve on it much. I've done a lot of work in series, and there was... Uh, a lot of work for books by Herman Hesse, which you can only read up until the age of 19, as you know. <laughs> but up until that age, he's a wonderfully provocative author. The, the, 
The great thing about Hesse, I found, was not so much the work, but the fact that his appearance changed dramatically through his life, and I was able to take advantage of that by doing this series. This is one out of a series of 15 or 20 books, and then it was repackaged for a German publisher in a rather nice way. This looks so un-American in terms of uh, jack design, but it, uh, the modesty of design is, I found, very appealing. And then I did a, a significant number of, of uh, paperback jackets, which had to be differentiated from novels and more important books, but had a kind of lively and engaging quality. I, I quite liked the way I repeated the form of the octopus in the corners of this jacket, which makes it interesting. This I did for Vladimir Nabokov, and the only remarkable thing about this book is that I did a sketch for it, and I got a two-page letter from Nabokov afterwards telling me precisely how to draw the space of Penin. And what he had done was that he had clipped a number of Russian journals, military and scientific, with faces that he had identified, and he said, this is the dome-like head of Marshal Zhukov, and that's what you should use. The space between the bottom of the nose and the top of the lip belongs to Seronsky, and, and so on. <laughs> In short, he gave me a complete map of the face that I returned to him, and he said, exactly. And sometimes, of course, uh, you work with typographical elements, and uh, it is always interesting to see that typography and um, uh, the other participants this evening will show you how typography can be used expressively, how typography also has the capacity to create imagery in the same way as a drawn-in image does. This is a nice... Uh, Nice jacket I've always liked of, uh, of the swastika with, as a chocolate bar with a bite taken out of it. I, um, I did a, a, a little book with uh, Conrad Aiken, and uh, at a certain point, the publisher asked Aiken if he would like to do a, a children's book. And uh, it was Harry Ford at uh, Athenaeum. And he put us together, and we evolved an interesting uh, relationship that involved my doing the drawings first and his writing the poem to the drawing, which is, as you know, a total historical inversion. I mean, this never happens, never happened, and it happened in this case. And so I would write, uh, to do a drawing a week, send it to Aikens, and the following week he would return my drawing with a poem attached to it. And there, were, there are a number of them, but I'll just show you two of them. This was a drawing of my cat, Ali, and he wrote a beautiful, beautiful poem about Ali, including the name Ali in the text. And here was a poem that he wrote to this drawing of a crocodile, and he cleverly made the typography echo the open mouth of the crocodile, which I thought was quite brilliant. In any case, it was the only, the only children's book that Aiken ever did, and I, I must say it was a wonderful experience doing it this way. And I never did it again, but any author who's interested, I'd be glad to provide some drawings. <laughs> And this is just a series of, uh, of drawings for a, uh, an Italian opera house for their season, showing how the sort of related images maintain the continuity of the season. And some illustrations for Baudelaire. Um, I realized when I got the poems that there was no way of illustrating Baudelaire. Um, so I decided to do something else, which was to create a series of landscapes that Baudelaire's cast of characters would be comfortable in. I've always had problems with illustrating 
books because of an experience I had as a child in reading, which is I would read a novel or a children's book, and uh, as I completed a chapter, I would come to an illustration depicting what the chapter contained, and invariably, I was so disappointed in the visual representation of what I had read because in my mind, it was so much more interesting, and the drawing or the painting seemed to be banal or mediocre or not extraordinary, with some exceptions of the work of Howard Pyle and other great American illustrators. But I've always had that as a problem in my mind that, that, that the story itself sometimes, and particularly when you're dealing with great literature, is so compelling that very often its visual equivalent is a disappointment. So here I escaped that. I'll show you two escape methods for dealing with that existential question. Here, the illustrations really are about places that Baudelaire or his cast of characters might have been comfortable. And I did one more thing, which is I turned the corners with the illustration. So the illustration starts, in this case, on a right-hand page, and then it goes around the page. And that does something in the reading experience. It sort of forces you to imagine the illustration that you have just passed. And as a result, instead of the usual passivity that is engaged in, in reading and looking at pictures, you had to have an active mind. Sometimes I went over four pages, as in this example, there's an opening right-hand page, and then two pages in the middle, and then a closing page. But there was something energizing about the idea that you had to retain the memory of what you had just seen and compare it to what you were now seeing. Another trick I did, precisely for the same reason, was when I had to illustrate the Divine Comedy, and I was given purgatory. I was disappointed because I wanted to do hell. <laughs> but actually, purgatory is much more interesting than hell, because purgatory is where we all are. And I discovered for the first time th the difference between hell and purgatory. I assume most of you know it, which is that in hell, nobody knows what they have done. As a result, they are doomed forever. And in purgatory, they know what they have done, and as a result, there's a way out. But what I was more concerned was with this same issue of how you deal with the expectation of the reader and not disappoint them because their visualization was better than yours. And I thought if you did two representations of the same moment in time, like this, there's only a second, or maybe a tenth of a second, between these two images, you would give the reader the opportunity to create a third image of their own. And that goes for this. And these are, uh, the reason I was able to do that is because these are monotypes, and I cut out pieces of paper and inked them, and then printed them, and then having the, all the elements again, I could re-ink them and reprint them. The only thing I couldn't do was to make them the same. And just a series of, uh, of recent books where I, uh, the issue was to take a very simple um, typographical form and see whether you could milk variations out of it because it's all about the war and Bush and 9-11 and so on. So here's just a series of variations using Bodoni in a variety of ways. Doomsday is sinking, fear is trembling, America is actually going backwards. A uh, cross replaces a T, the lettering is obliterated diagonally, and then the secret is diminished in size. So just a very simple idea. And this was a cover that uh, I did for Philip Roth. And w w it's an interesting uh, dialectic with Philip because he always tells you what he wants and I try not to do what he wants and send them what I want and then we have a conversation about it and, and I'm quite sure that uh, tonight we'll discover that others have similar experience in trying to accommodate the ideas of the author. 
In this case, this is entirely done by Philip. He had the stamp. He said, I want this stamp, and I want a swastika on it, and I want it to be this scene, and I want the scene on the back of the cover, un, uh, affected by the swastika and the sort of mutilated on the front, and that was it. I mean, I didn't have to do a thing, and I actually like this cover. <laughs> when I was um, married many years ago, my wife and I did this children's book. This was 1958, called If Apples Had Teeth. It was very charming. We had a good time doing it, and then 45 years later, we decided to do a second book because we'd enjoyed it so much. And so we did this little book called uh, The Alpha Zets, which is a book about the nature of the alphabet and the characters. A is angry, F is fancy, D is dynamic, E is elegant, and so on. And all these letters enter into a room and begin to interact. Uh, and they don't know exactly what's going on. And uh, they each have a very distinctive character. It's interesting that the word character is defined to a mode of being and character is defined to a letter form. The same, there must be a relationship between those two things. At any rate, the room fills <laughs> and it becomes intolerable, a real behavioral sink, and everybody is miserable and they're screaming and they're pushing and they're indignant and they are not getting along at all. And then the lights go out and there is silence, and suddenly a word is spoken, and it says, let there be light. And the lights go on, and these individual characters discover why they were in the room. It was because together they could make, make something bigger than themselves. And then the payoff of the book is, in the beginning, there was the word. Thank you. Thank you, Milton. That was wonderful. Um, if you go to bookstores a lot, which I assume people still do, even though you don't have to anymore, as you know with the miracle of the internet, um, you'll see people sometimes doing odd things, different odd things. And one of the odd things you may see people doing is people standing um, in front of the books on the rack, picking them up in turn, looking at the cover, then flipping to the back cover, and then just looking at the back flap. Um, I've been known to do that as many as 30 times in a single session in a bookstore. Um, my daughter will say, why are you doing that? And the first time she saw me, she said, why are you doing that? She said, I just want to see who did the cover, that's all. Um, so if you see someone doing that, they're a designer or odder still, just someone curious about who did the cover. But usually, uh, as Milton said, that's of interest just to um, other designers for the most part. So I was doing that about 15 years ago, and I came upon a cover that didn't look like any cover I'd ever seen before. Um, the book was called Watching the Body Burn by Thomas Glynn. I flipped to the back flap, and there was a name, Chip Kid. Jack, cover designed by Chip Kid. So I had um, heard lots of names and forgotten lots of names, but I didn't forget that name, Chip Kid. And um, someone later told me that was the Daryl Strawberry effect. If you know uh, uh, New York baseball in the 80s, um, uh, there were lots of different outfielders, but Daryl Strawberry was always getting elected to the uh, all-star team uh, because the voters would sort of see all these unfamiliar names and see this name, Daryl Strawberry, and just think it was kind of cute and vote for Daryl so he would get in. Now, I don't think that Chip has really uh, benefited that much from the memorability of his name. He benefits from his inexhaustible talent. Um, I will read you a couple of titles. Geek Love, The Secret History, The Remains of the Day, all the Pretty Horses, Jurassic Park, Dress Your Family in Corduroy and Denim. Very different books, one thing in common. The author's name on the front is always different. That name on the inside back flap is always the same, Chip Kidd. You can find all those covers in his book, 
published this year, Chip Kid, Book One, uh, an inexhaustible uh, gallery of the kind of imagination you're about to witness from our next speaker. Please welcome Chip Kidd. <clears throat> I'd like to thank you all for coming. We were certain that we were going to outnumber you. Um, <clears throat> when I was asked to do this, um, I was trying to figure out how to, how to focus, how to, how to um, just distill it down into a, a mercifully brief presentation of book covers. And it occurred to me that um, 2006 has been a very interesting year for, for us, for book covers. Now, when I say us, I'm mainly talking about Knopf. This is uh, on October 8th. I celebrated my, well, celebrated, it was my uh, 20th year. Uh, at Knopf, um, designing book jackets with our amazing um, uh, de uh, art department there. And um, there's, it's been a very interesting year for, for our department and for me in terms of, of the book jackets. So I'm going to show a survey of work just from the past year. Um, and all of the jackets that I'm going to show you have a curious thing in common. It's pretty crass, actually, uh, but I'll wait sort of till the end to, to expose it, as it were, and um, tr try and imagine what it is. Or maybe, maybe it's blatantly obvious. I, I don't know. Um, these aren't really in um, any pr chronological order. Um, I've, working with Updike is, is, a, is a real pleasure. He's frighteningly prolific. He pretty much comes up with a book uh, once a year. And um, <clears throat> sometimes I design them, sometimes uh, Carol Carson, uh, the art director at Knopf, uh, designs them, and we sort of you know, trade off. And um, with John, you never know what's going to happen, because he studied typography briefly in college. which is particularly distressing um, <laughs> because sometimes he'll literally say, well, I think my name should be an 18-point perpetua. <laughs> but of course, if you know what that means, that means it's going to be this big. But you just sort of have to do it to show him that perhaps this is not the way to go. And um, anyway, so with Terrorist, um, he, he actually did his own art research, uh, which is not unusual for him, and, but then he set up uh, this photograph, very interesting photograph, in the context of a newspaper headline, terrorist, and there he is. And, um, and so I basically said, uh, you know, Mr. Updike, I think that the photograph itself is powerful enough. I don't think we need to set it in the context of this newspaper. I think it'll be more powerful if we don't. And that's exactly what we did. And, um, and he was, but he's very, you know, he, when he saw this, he's like, you're right. This is, this is terrific. Thank you. Um, so uh, this book came out earlier this spring, Jay McInerney's uh, novel about uh, well-to-do New Yorkers um, who experience 9-11 um, and how they cope with it. And uh, the, the title, to me, set it off right away. I, I, I do read the books uh, before I do the, the covers, and I thought the novel was terrific. Um, but as soon as I grasped what he was getting at, I knew exactly what we had to do. Um, but no, curiously, nobody else had done it on, on a novel, which is actually to use pictures of, of Ground Zero to illustrate uh, the jacket. Um, certainly, of course, that had been done numerous times with the, with the nonfiction books. But with, with, the, um, with the novels like Jonathan Safran Foer's Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, uh, they really stuck to illustration. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to take the reader there, um, especially considering... Uh, what the good life actually is or was, do we know anymore? Um, and this is a selection of, of photos from uh, Magnum and uh, Century 21, a uh, rack of suits, uh, uh, a, a glass from a, from a restaurant and somebody's um, uh, coffee table that they were finally let back into weeks later to take pictures. Um, 
I do uh, all the jackets for Augustine Burroughs, except, of course, running with scissors, um, because we didn't know each other at that point. But uh, after that, he asked me to do the, uh, all, the, all of his subsequent covers. This, is, this came out in June. Um, and we were on the phone, and he said, so do you want to hear the title of the book? And, he, and he, I said, of course. And he told me this, and instantly I knew what I wanted to do. That's the best feeling in the world, when it's just like, boom, it blooms in your head, and you know exactly what it is. And I said, ah, oh, I know what the jacket is. And he says, oh, please tell me. And I said, no. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> You're just going to have to wait and see it. Um, I'm terrible. I'm a terrible lawyer for my ideas. Um, when you go into a bookstore, I'm not going to be standing next to the damn thing telling you why you should like it, right? You know, you're just going to go in and it's either going to work for you or it's not, right? So, I, so I'm not going to try and describe this to him over the phone. I'm just going to do it and then, and then let him react to it. And th for this, I used... Um, a, uh, a photographer uh, named Jeff Spear, who's one of my best friends, and we, and we do a lot of, of jackets together. And uh, so we put an ad in the Village Voice uh, for this particular hand model. <laughs> and uh, we got a lot of cranks answering the ad, who obviously it was a fake. But then we found the right person. Um, uh, really terrific and very cooperative, and I, so I put this together and I sent it off, this is a freelance job, and I sent it off to the art director of St. Martin's, and uh, he called me back and he said, marketing loves it. And the reason they love it is because it's yellow and there's a hand on it. <laughs> Thank you, marketing. I have been privileged to do uh, Cormac McCarthy's jackets in-house at Knopf since uh, All the Pretty Horses, which was the beginning of the Border Trilogy, and then uh, his subsequent novel, No Country for Old Men, and then this one, which, which, uh, which came out this fall. And the great thing about uh, McCarthy is he's been compared to Faulkner in reviews and, and essays and this kind of thing, but he's, he was also very much like Faulkner in another legendary way in that Faulkner used to say to Bennett Cerf in terms of, the book, of his book jackets, you know, I write them, you guys publish them. As in, I do my job, you do your job, I don't tell you what to do, you don't tell me what to do. And Sure enough, you know, Cormac, very reclusive. In the beginning, he did actually used to come to the office, which was really cool. Uh, but he was really nice, soft-spoken, great guy, but he never said a peep about any of his jackets uh, other than nice jacket. Um, <laughs> until this one. <laughs> now, um, as you may or may not know, the Road is a sort of um, post-apocalyptic tale of a nameless man and his little eight-year-old son as they make their way through a, uh, uh, through a, a, a decimated landscape, just trying to survive. They're basically just trying to survive, and they, they're instinctually heading south um, in, in America, and it's just, you know... There, there's a few other people who are usually like deformed or murderous or whatever, but it's really, really, really bleak. Um, very little color is described at all except various shades of gray and black, um, and then a little bit of red here and there. Anyway, um, so I found this photo by a guy named uh, Jason Fulford, which was originally in color. I sucked the color out of it on the computer, made it black and white, and this to me, I mean, that's it. That's, you know, it's the car that used to work and doesn't anymore welcome to the new world. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and very understated typography. Uh, our editor-in-chief, Sonny Mehta, liked this very much. We sent this to his, to uh, Cormac McCarthy's agent, who sent it to him, and he rejected it. He thought it was too literal. He found an image that he liked better. And his, um, I mean, we're just like stunned. I mean, this has never happened before. Um, it's like, okay, bring it on. 
and his, his agent's on the phone with me. She says, oh, wait till you see this photo. It's just fabulous. <laughs> and so I get on the phone to her, and I said, you do realize this is the facade of the World Trade Center. It is? I said, uh, yeah. Appeared in the New Yorker. Pretty damn famous. Um, so seeing as the book does take place in the South, This will be an extraordinary leap for the reader to make. <laughs> they are on foot, you know. <laughs> oh, well, all right. Well, he says he has another piece of art that he really likes a lot. So I'll get him to find that and, and send it to you. This is a bombed out dilapidated opera house in Havana. <laughs> and I said, they don't go that far south. <laughs> There's no way to get to Cuba <laughs> in, in the post-apocalyptic world. And then he does something, again, that he never does. He, he's like, he not only found this image, he basically set it up in a design. And then, and I was actually allowed to talk with him on the phone, which was kind of a thrill because he's so reclusive. But he's like, well, I don't see why my name has to be on the front. <laughs> and of course, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm like, well, of course it doesn't. You're so right. <laughs> you genius, you. And this is exactly how he set up the cover. Um, now, of course, because the, the image is horizontal, but the book is vertical, so we're just going to have to turn it on its side. <laughs> So I work this up, and I show it to our editor-in-chief, who, whose head explodes. <laughs> and you haven't lived until you've been sitting in Sonny Maida's office when his head explodes. <laughs> Luckily, I was wearing something plastic, so I didn't have to worry about that. But he was furious, and I called up, I called up uh, Cormac's agent, and I said, what is going on? And she said, well, listen, let me tell you. He, Cormac is going through a terrible divorce. And this book is an allegory of him losing custody of his son. It's his most personal book ever. And I'm thinking, okay, that kind of explains it, but this doesn't really help us, and what the hell are we going to do? And she's like, I don't know. <laughs> You're just going to have to fix it. So now I'm thinking, okay, typography, just type. And um, trying to come up with a way so that his name is on it, but not on it, to try and make everybody happy. And of course, you're not going to be able to see it in a slide. Uh, but the book, it, I mean, you could go, it's still out. You could go out in a bookstore and see it. Um, what, this is like the black on black factor, where his name is matte, and, and the, the background is glossy, and his, and his name like emerges only the closer that you get to it. I'm glad that amuses you. <laughs> I actually have to say things like that in meetings, okay? <laughs> it's called working for a corporation. <laughs> Somehow, this manages to uh, please everybody. And, and, you know, I have said over and over, book jackets do not sell books. Bookstores sell books. <laughs> what the jacket can do, the jacket is like a, a name tag at a singles party. 
So you go in and you read the person's name tag, you look at the person, and then you're either going to strike it up and go home or not. <laughs> Same thing with a book cover. Um, I've also uh, been very privileged to do Haruki Murakami's book jackets. He's a sensational author, um, Japanese. Uh, Blind Willow, Sleeping Woman is a collection of his short stories which came out this summer. Um, he's, I know that he's very much enamored of uh, vintage jazz records from Japan. And I, so I was managed to find um, a book of these things and I did a riff as it were, on a, on a jacket for him. Uh, so this is sort of mimicking a Japanese jazz record album cover. You know, I inserted the woman's eyes and bent things around and blah, blah, blah. He liked this very much, except he said, you realize that those, that Japanese woman's eyes that you've used is an extremely famous Japanese jazz singer from the 60s and everyone will recognize her. <laughs> and of course, my initial thought is, Haruki, you're using again. <laughs> but of course, I can't say that. So he specifically asked to just switch the eyes to a Westerner woman. So that's what I had to do. Um, and it's okay, it's just not nearly as interesting as the other one, and nobody's gonna recognize that other person. Crazy. <laughs> um, uh, and then the back ad sort of mimics the old hi-fi uh, back covers of album covers. Um, okay, now I also wanted to show some work from other people in our office. Uh, we have an amazing staff of five designers at Knopf. Um, what you're about to see is by a, a wonderful designer there named Abby Weintraub. And I just wanted to show this because I think it's such a huge triumph. Um, this book, I, I, I don't think I need to tell you what it is, um, but um, you know, this was going to be a big deal. And this is Nora Ephron complaining about all her, her physical ailments and all this kind of thing. So. <clears throat> There are expectations about what something like this should look like. And what Abby did so brilliantly was completely over, you know, she completely turned them on their head <clears throat> and, and did this. And we've all, besides this being totally elegant and <clears throat> sensational, it totally gets that moment where I don't care how old you are, but you're trying to open your medication and it's a childproof cap, which of course means that you can't open it. <laughs> so that's implied, but it's just, it's elegant and uh, it, it's simple, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's yellow, <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> I have a gold star in here for you. Anyway, hooray. Uh, this is one that I did. It's not very good. This is the case of the, the British jacket comes out a season before yours. They basically used this photo, and I had to use it. Um, I didn't really want to, uh, but um, this is what I originally wanted to do, which um, is using a, a, a Nazi passport, which would be die cut with this painting of this woman's face coming through. And, and this was just considered too weird and risky, and uh, they went with the other one. Really, really great, terrific book, Sweet Francis. Um, this, this cover isn't so great. It's just the, the problem with this was, how do you show Al-Qaeda? If you go on the web and you do um, a photo search for Al-Qaeda, you're not going to find much. That's part of like their whole identity is that they have no identity. They don't look like anything. <laughs> so the, the only real concrete piece of, of visual um, uh, ephemera for them that I could find was a wanted poster, and that's basically what I used and, and what we call ghosted it back so that you read the type first and then you see the members of it behind. 
Um, this also is by the um, beautiful and talented Abby Weintraub in our office. This is, this is what, what we graphic designers call Typography 101. And everybody gets this assignment in school. You, um, you, you pick a word and then make it look like what it is. And what, but what she did, which is so elegant, is that she could have had it like bursting into flame or, you know, uh, but it's so elegant in the way it's just starting to melt. And uh, again, it just it's complete. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is by a guy in our office named Peter Mendelssohn, who's also terrific. It's very easy to do something like this badly, and he certainly did not. Um, he's, and he's totally enamored of that uh, crazy uh, Great Leap Forward imagery that was produced in, in the 60s, and that's what he's borrowing from here to, to make this. Um, this is by our art director, Carol Devine Carson. Again, a great surprise success story at Knopf. That's, it really is uh, affirming to, to work at Knopf when you've got this novel that everybody loves and we have the great hopes for, but not the great expectations, quite frankly, and then it just, just, it just destroys all that and, and bursts out. And this is just a simple vid visual metaphor of the emperor's children and just the concept of a, a grand Upper West Side apartment building as a castle. Really? I know where you live. <laughs> uh, this just came out, Nature Girl, Carl Hyacin, and using this amazing illustrator, cartoonist, uh, Charles Burns, who we just love with all our hearts, and who we also publish at Pantheon. I, I also edit a line of graphic novels at Pantheon, and we published Charles Burns this past year. Uh, this I had the privilege of working on. This was just a matter of getting a bunch of images from Anderson's uh, assistant and then figuring out how to use them in a way that would hopefully be a little bit more interesting. Um, there was this picture of him on the beach at the tsunami after Sri Lanka, but there was also a picture of him uh, warming himself with the crew at a bonfire there, and then just how to combine them to, to, to sort of like blatantly represent the kind of like fire that, that resides within him, within him that, that lights him up to do what he does. Uh, this sadly will not happen. This is a cover that I did for Michael Chabin. This book will come out, I believe, next February. It's called The, the Yiddish Policeman's Union, and it's a novel in which Michael invents Yiddish noir. <laughs> Which is, you know, this, uh, and it takes place in this settlement in, in Alaska, and this Yiddish detective. <laughs> it really, it really is an amazing book. Um, it's it's really fantastic. But there was like only one idea that would that that occurred to me, which was which was this, and I, I'm not a, a, an illustrator at all like Milton, but I took a chance and just drew this myself, and to me that was, that was the, the jacket. Chabin loved it, HarperCollins did not. Start your writing campaign. <laughs> okay, um, so what did all of these covers have in common? The Chabin accepted. They were all New York Times bestsellers, and, and I know it's crass to go there, but we are a publishing company. Our, our publishing company is a business, and we have to keep that in mind. And, but w what I like about what, what, what we do is that it's possible to transcend what the preconceived idea is of what a bestseller should look like, and that it can look like any of these things that don't have foil stamping and don't have big, giant, garish, awful lettering and blah de blah de blah And it's, it's basically our daily task to, to constantly remind people, both people that we work with and work for, and the industry in general, that um, a bestseller doesn't have to look crass and, and disgusting. Um, so, Here's my favorite example of this in the past year. And I don't know how many of you recognize this about this book jacket. This is uh, by our art director, Carol Devine Carson, who's just amazing. And she did something with this that is just so sensational. And of course, this is um, Joan Didion's memoir of the death of her husband, John Gregory Dunn. And what she means by the year of magical thinking is that after he dies, it was so sudden and so unbelievable 
that it was then became possible to conjure in her head that at the slightest moment he could reappear. And it, that seemed real, and of course it never was. But what Carol did with the jacket was that she made it real on the cover, and, and, that, she, and that John is in the lettering of, of the cover. Um, so can we go back? Uh, the, uh, can we go back one? So this is how the, the jacket was. And so, you know, you would see that some of the letters were slightly different color and it's like, why? And then, and then your head puts it together. I just put the circles there to kind of like tip it off. And really just, and, and, and again, this sold 600,000 copies. It's like, come on, it doesn't have to be stupid to work. Um, and so I'm just going to part here with a quick lesson. I'm going to show two actual book covers um, and, and incorporate them in a lesson of what to do and what not to do. We're going to start. <laughs> we're going to start with what not to do. This is an actual book cover. I saw it in a bookstore, and I thought this is so stupid that I have to buy it and show it to you. <laughs> now. I studied graphic design at Penn State University. I loved it. And um, we had this amazing teacher named Lanny Simis, who's still there. And on the first day, he came into the uh, classroom, and he went up to the blackboard, and he drew a, a, a crude picture of an apple, and he wrote the word apple underneath it. And he said, listen up. <laughs> and he covered up the word apple. And he said, you either show this, and then he covered up the, the picture, and he said, or you say this. And then he took his arm away, he said, but you don't do this. <laughs> because you're going to be treating your audience like morons. So... <laughs> now, I'm sure everything was very well meant with this cover. I don't know who designed it, I don't care, but I just, when I saw this, I just thought, no. And, and the, ty you know, the typography is lovely and it's a Durer drawing, but I don't care. Um, because you're basically saying to your audience that you're a moron. And who knows, maybe Arthur Vogelzang insisted, but um, <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you another actual book cover. This is from the 1950s. It's a, it's a, a pocket books paperback, designer sadly uncredited. Um, but when we moved our offices a couple of years ago, somebody was insanely throwing this away, and I snatched it. And when I first saw it, I wasn't quite exactly sure what I was seeing. Um, but then it very gradually became clear to me. Now... The name of this novel, <laughs> your thoughts? <laughs> the name of this novel is You Shall Know Them by Ver Coors, but what the designer has done is encrypted it with a subliminal message <laughs> such that once upon seeing it, one feels strangely compelled <laughs> to pick it up and start reading. And that's what we have to do. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Uh, we now come to our last speaker of the evening. Um, uh, Dave Eggers does not work for a big corporation. He works for himself. He started out doing it all himself. Um, someone sent me an email and said, you have to go to this website. This is a few years ago. It's McSweeney's.net. And this was, I think, in the uh, uh, late 90s when every website had, you know, rotating typography and flaming things and all kinds of stuff. And um, I went to this thing, McSweeney's, and all it is is a bunch of centered default typography and a white background with a little funny drawing at the top. And what makes it interesting is not that it has 
flaming logos or anything, but that the stuff that's written on it is literate and funny and engaging, and you have to come back to it again and again. I became a regular visitor and taken with the tone of voice of it and sort of the undesigned quality of it. Then um, a little bit later, I was up at a bookstore, Coliseum Books on 57th Street. It's gone from there, gone from everywhere soon. Uh, looking at their journals, and they had one called uh, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, obviously related to that website. I took it out. It was a print version, sort of seemingly related to the website, but it had what I detected uh, was a really specific and bizarre and memorable sort of design character to it. It was filled with typography, all the same typeface, Garamond, and sort of done in this almost kind of um, uh, uh, maniacal outsider artist sort of way, layer upon layer, every space crammed on the cover with all this type. And um, I remember sort of thinking, well, what is this anyway? Who is this guy? And I started saying, who is, like, who is McSweeney anyway? And then someone who was in the know said, this, it ain't McSweeney, it's this guy named Dave Eggers. And he writes all his stuff in Quark Express. <laughs> so I, you know, I thought, wow, well, that, that is someone who cares about design, that they don't even bother writing it normally. They just go right to the layout program and write it like that. I said, is he a designer, is he a writer? And the answer was yes. And in fact, the answer is yes. Um, he um, has uh, grown ever more successful, ever more famous since those early days, uh, coming, I think, onto the scene of the popular imagination with the publication of his novel, the aptly titled A Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius, all in Garamon. Um, <laughs> his uh, latest, very well-reviewed, well-regarded novel, what is the what is uh, out right now, and everything he publishes uh, under his imprint at McSweeney's is um, intelligent, engaging, often funny, but always, always beautifully designed. And um, the design is, uh, um, exhibits a kind of imagination that I see nowhere else in publishing, really. And uh, he showed us backstage uh, a copy of McSweeney's uh, volume 22, which is um, uh, just astonishing in the way it's uh, put together and bound, and I uh, uh, can't wait for you all to see it, which you will eventually. Uh, but what you'll see right now is the man himself. Please welcome Dave Eggers. Chip is good, huh? I didn't want that to end. Um, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just explain that what Michael was saying, that the reason that the McSweeney site is so simple, and a lot of what we do is so simple, is because I won't update any of my software. And I don't know if the designers out there will know what I'm talking about. I use Quark 4.1 <laughs> in System 9. I don't know, non-designers like you guys are like, yeah, yeah. Um, but, and, uh, but, and the McSweeney site, I dial up for my internet, and I only get on for about an hour a day. I don't have any ability to get on faster, and uh, I'm scared of the consequences if I had a fast connection, because I wouldn't work. So uh, I, the design has to be simple enough for me to immediately be able to read it on, the, uh, on my dial-up system. So that it's, uh, everything is a little backwards. Um, I'm really, really incredibly uh, happy to be here among uh, 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 Chip and Milton, uh, heroes of mine, because I was, uh, I feel lucky to be able to design books at all, and especially books um, that, uh, that we're proud of some of these books, um, uh, and most of them, because I was a, an art major and a failed painting student, and then uh, later a very, very bad designer. For about six years, I worked as a designer and a design temp, and uh, spent one long summer in, uh, at Pac Bell at the corporate headquarters out in Danville, California. And my job was to design the congratulatory, inter-office congratulatory certificates. <laughs> if somebody had done a really good job with their work uh, that week, and I would, that was my job, eight hours a day. Good job, Ed, you know. And, <laughs> And they, they were 
they loved my certificates, you know? <laughs> it was very rewarding because they just patted me on the back and wanted me there forever and thought I really had a future <laughs> in certificate design at Pac Bell. Um, anyway, it wasn't until we started McSweeney's in uh, uh, 98 that um, because we were, there wasn't a, a client to deal with, and I was always bad with clients, um, uh, we could, I could sort of, I finally locked into kind of a design scheme that um, played well with my many limitations. So I had collected old bi Bibles for a long time, and I just loved not only the way that the type was laid out, but just the way that it was all one sentence in a way, but it would go from this little murmur, you know, at the top, and then suddenly, the Holy Bible, and then it would go down again, and then, oh, the New Testaments, and da da you know, and it just got strange, and then there's just these, like, marginal references. I don't even know what that means, but they would just come out with, you know, da-da-da, and then punch you with it. So when we did the first issue of McSweeney's, this is the first one, which I, I did the cover before we had the interior uh, all done yet. So I was just playing with the center justified type and, uh, and also just writing it all. as, And I was collecting a lot of old pamphlets and... Uh, and old books from the uh, 19th century and early 20th century that were very engaging, like books about, you know, were like snake oil salesman sort of books and people that were trying to sell their philosophy of life. And they were very personal, very like grab you by the lapels and talk to you about whatever they were trying to communicate. And I sort of liked that personal touch because I was working at a big corporate magazine uh, when McSweeney's, I was supposed to be working there. And I was had an office and not much to do, so... Uh, I used all of their equipment and uh, uh, copier and, you know, printer and FedEx and all that <laughs> to put out this first issue. And uh, we printed in, in uh, I met a, I was interviewing an artist in, in Williamsburg and he had had a catalog printed in Iceland and, and I didn't believe him and it was a long story but uh, there, was that, there, and there was actually an, a printer in Iceland called, called Odie and they had a New Jersey print rep uh, named Arnie Sigurdsson. Um, and so I met Arnie, and I got a quote on this, and it was very competitive. So uh, we printed the first issue there, and I went over and flew there one night uh, on a red eye and got there in the morning. And they printed the entire run of 2,500 2, copies in four days, and I went home with them on the plane. Uh, but I spent those days in the middle of winter in Reykjavik just going back and forth for press checks, and it was an incredible experience. But I was sort of hooked then on the whole printing process and trying to learn more about it. This is the second issue that got a little bit more involved. And this is the third one, which is sort of the logical conclusion where it's, I love that, what Michael was saying about the outsider art. I really wanted it to look crazy. You know, like somebody just spent way too much time alone uh, <laughs> with the cover, you know, just thrown, which I was, I was this guy. And um, I was living in Brooklyn and I had this terrible, tiny little closet office, and I thought all of our work in the early days was uh, articles and stories that had been killed by other magazines and didn't fit into other, you know, traditional magazine format. And uh, so it was a bunch of, like, it was the land of misfit stories, and I thought, well, the covers had to look uh, crazy that way, too. So this was the logical end of that, and, um, and then it was time to sort of purge, and uh, we went with, and this is all Garamond 3, which is true. Uh, I couldn't, partly because my computer, I couldn't, I don't know how to use the type management software and all that. So Caramon 3, I like the look of it, and it does, and it holds really well with a lot of different forms and italics and small caps and all this, and, and it tracks out really well. But also, I just, I could only get a few fonts working at any given time. So I figured, okay, how do we, you know, I love the constraint, the idea of the constraint in general. So if you just use one font, how far can you take it? So anyway, we purged at that point and went with a simpler um, next cover, which was, um, uh, uh, a, I did a painting. I don't know if I did it for this cover or if I was just painting. I'd paint a lot of birds with arms. And so I was painting a bird with, a, with arms instead of wings and uh, <laughs> wooden planks for feet. And, um, and then I thought, okay, well, and then the other thing with this one was that we were, you know, I was visiting the plant a lot and seeing all the different printing that they do there. They, in Reykjavik, they do a lot of art book printing. And, and uh, 
So I thought, okay, well, we've done these three issues of paperback books that look uh, nice, and, and, but how far can we push it? And at the same time, I had a lot of friends who were getting their first books published, and um, they, they, weren't getting, they weren't involved enough with the design process that they, as, as much as they wanted to be. They wanted to uh, work with the art directors, and you know, just like uh, Chip and Milton always consult, and they work closely together. But some of my friends were frustrated by their experiences, and so I thought, okay, well, let's, inside each story will have its own cover, and that each author will be able to design his own uh, cover. And so, you know, on the right there is a story by Rick Moody, and he had uh, a friend of his do the cover. And sometimes they just chose the art, sometimes they designed the whole thing. There's a there's a Dennis Johnson booklet on the left. These are all, these are 14 different booklets that came in a box. And so the issue four was a box, and they designed these covers, we put them all together, and then the problem was in, in Iceland, they don't have boxes uh, much. <laughs> they don't make them. And so, uh, this is true. There's a, a, so we had to meet with the one box maker, and there was a guy, there was a company called Box Maker, and um, <laughs> it's really, and, uh, and we met with him, and we worked for like a week um, in, in, in Reykjavik on the box. And it was like really the, inventing the box from scratch there, you know? Like, okay, it's going you know, it was funny. And, and it didn't turn out so well. The box falls apart almost immediately. If anybody owns that issue, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> this is the next one. Uh, a little bit later, we did another issue that was also booklets. And... Um, I was trying to recreate old pictures I had seen. I've never seen it in person, but where you have the school children walking home with their book in a belt, like tied together with a belt. Is anybody, was it a belt? Is that what it was? Anyway, I had all these old etchings of that kind of thing, and, um, but I couldn't, we, we priced out belts, and um, it was too expensive. So we did two things with this. One, we, we got rid of, um, uh, this was a hardcover core. So you take the, the raw board, and then it has a cloth, spine there, and then it's seven booklets inside, and it's just a stamp on the, on the raw board, which we like, and then we tried to think of how to tie it together, would it be a rope, would it be whatever, and, um, and we went with a rubber band, and I got like a whole box of samples of rubber bands from Reykjavik, you know, to choose the rubber band, how thick or thin, which is one of my favorite moments ever, to get the box of rubber bands. And when we finally chose this one, it, we went with it, and uh, all the booklets were done. But um, we were at press um, at the same time as the whole anthrax scare, scare here. And so they had them all ready to go, all these rubber bands. But they had, when you pack rubber bands together, you have to use a lot of that powder, you know, which looks exactly like anthrax. So <laughs> they were afraid we, they were going to have this huge problem with customs, which that we would, I'm sure. And... Um, so they had to, the, our print rep over there, Biasi, he took all of the rubber bands home and washed them in his washing machine. <laughs> and then brought them back and then used them on the books. That's true. So they're all a little darker than they normally would be because they're like saturated somehow with his Icelandic washing machine water. <laughs> These are some of the booklets inside. That's a uh, Chris Ware booklet uh, he designed for Michael Shabon's story. And, and that's Catherine Streeter, and that's Eric White. These are all great artists who just sort of took over, and we gave them, we connected them with the authors and gave them full control. Um, this is, uh, Chip was making fun of foil stamping, and, um, <laughs> but this is, uh, I'd been visiting the plant many times and just walking around and seeing what other books they did, and I saw that they were doing a lot, they printed all the Bibles in Iceland. They're really the only printers, so it would follow that they would be printing the Bibles. And, um, but I fell in love with this idea of foil stamping. And so we, this was another, I went back to the crazy outsider um, involved design and, and, and did this. And we printed a hardcover book on a leatherette cover and then foil stamped it. But we came up with the leatherette cover sort of late in the game. And they said, well, it's going to take months, many, many months um, to order enough of that color. We wanted it to be this is black. And they said, and I said, well, do you have anything on the floor? And they said, yeah, we've got enough for, and we needed to print like, I think 20,000 of these. And so he broke it down and they said, uh, we have enough for uh, 7,000 blue, <laughs> 5,000 brown, 
or something like that, and then like so and so, you know, 8,000 black, and then 900 yellow. <laughs> and it's not quite that yellow, it's, it's, a more, it's a better color than that. But we said, okay, you know, print them uh, whatever you've got. And um, so the yellow ones are, are quite rare. <laughs> now, um, so I, my first book had all this front matter in it. It went on and on for like 64 pages or something of throat clearing. And um, so for the second book, I thought early on while writing it, I thought that I should, you know, skip all that and get right into the story. So we went, we printed the type on the cover. And this is just a, another stamp right on the raw board, which um, I, it looked good at when it first came out. I think it looked fine. But if you read it, the whole book, it com almost completely disintegrates. Have you guys noticed that, anybody? <laughs> uh, this was a, the beauty of, you know, I, this is, uh, is the self-publishing. We have a tiny company that now there's seven of us, but for the most part, it's usually been three, four of us until very recently. But we could sort of print whatever little editions that we wanted to. This is an alternate edition of the same book that had 40 pages inserted in the middle that sort of negate the rest of the book in a way. And so we printed 2,000 of these and did a different cover and um, same kind of look. This was a, a, a novel uh, that Elizabeth Carey is another designer in San Francisco and I did together, uh, Stephen Dixon's Eye, where we, this is our first, this, I didn't even know really that you could do a die cut through full board like that. And um, I'd seen it done in jackets. And, uh, but anyway, we, d we cut through the whole board for the title and then underneath is this Dan Klaus drawing of the author, because it's an autobiographical book. This was a, a, a collection of stories that I never published, but we told the Icelandic printer that we were going to print X amount of copies of this, so we ordered all this yellow um, cloth, and uh, they, they got it all, they kept it in stock, and then I didn't do this collection, and, uh, but we had all this cloth, and so he, they were getting on us all the time about the cloth. What are you going to do about the cloth? And, um, you know, we had to pay storage costs for the cloth, and, you know, they were really mad about the cloth, and because um, they don't usually order this much yellow cloth, and then what are you going to do with it? And so, so we had, didn't issue a, an Icelandic issue of uh, McSweeney's, issue 15, which collected all of the best contemporary Icelandic literature. Um, it's about time. And we, uh, this was a, a drawing uh, by Leif Parsons, uh, just two colors, uh, Pantone colors, and, uh, and I just gave him a sketch that said, you can do everything below this area, because everything above there is going to be the sky, and it has to be yellow uh, <laughs> to use the cloth. So uh, we got that done. And then, because we worked with sort of a, you know, it's sort of a silk screening kind of process on that, um, and we, were, we had this series of novels called The Rectangulars that we uh, put together. And um, we wanted to sort of recreate like Milton's series, the Signet series, and those series where you sort of have an identity to it. And that when you pick up the book, you know the general nature of the novel or that it'll be formally inventive or, you know, and have a certain feel to it. Um, so this is The Rectangulars, which are uh, a three-piece there with a, a cloth spine and, uh, and a little sticker there. It says rectangulars. This is by Rachel Sumter, an amazing artist we work with a lot. This is the second one in the series, Icelander by Dustin Long. It's the same sort of look, and it has a foil stamp. And let me think what this last one is. That's by Josh Cochran. And this is another Rachel Sumter, The People of Paper. Uh, I'm going to go really quickly. I, you know what? I'm late. Um, this is the Believer magazine we do. How's that? This is, <laughs> this is another issue. This is basically, this is Charles Burns again, but, you know, again, l working within our, our limitations, we thought we have to have a magazine that has the smallest staff possible because we weren't going to take ads. We have to be able to do this on a shoestring. So we put together a magazine, and I designed a template, this cover and everything inside, such that one person could maintain the monthly magazine uh, every, every month. And so there's a, a guy that came on. He quit college to take the job, Andrew Leland, and he learned Quark. I taught him our design system, and uh, <laughs> that's true, on my Quark 4.1. This is our whole company we use this program. And um, 
And so uh, Andrew does everything inside, and Alvaro Villanueva, another designer we work with, does the covers each month, and they have uh, increasingly gotten more complex, and it's flexible here that you can... <laughs> uh, this is a series called The Haggis on Way, uh, uh, a World of Unbelievable Brilliance. This is a series of uh, reference books for children about different subjects that they might be interested in, um, except for all the information inside is false. So... <laughs> This is a, it's a fundraising series for our nonprofit, 826 Valencia, and my little brother Tof and I write these together. This is based giraffes, giraffes on my, a, few, a month I worked at Hal Reine Agency in San Francisco, and they were pitching the Sears campaign, and they were putting like a million dollars into the campaign, and their, their pitch for it, they didn't get the campaign, but their pitch was, for the new slogan for all Sears, everything was Sears. Sears? Sears. <laughs> so that's what that's based on. Giraffes? Giraffes. Uh, these are two more. This is the second one. Your disgusting head. And uh, this is the new one. Animals of the ocean, in particular the giant squid. <laughs> this is all foil stamp and the artwork in the middle uh, <clears throat> is... Uh, is by one of my favorite artists who, uh, why am I spacing on his name? He's like my favorite guy. <laughs> Chip? What? No, no, not on that one. Damn it, I'm gonna name him in a second because he's incredible. Whew. Um, all right, I'm gonna run through a few more of these. This is Waffen that we do uh, as a sketch for that. Na -na 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 so this is, uh, this is my uh, novel about Valentino Deng. Um, from, uh, his, uh, 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 from Sudan, and uh, I wrote his biography, and uh, um, this is very early on. It was called Hello Children. I drew this sketch. I always wanted his face right there in the front, and um, so then Rachel Sumter, oh, we went to Mario Bai, back to his hometown in 2003, and that's Valentino in the middle, and some of his friends uh, that he knew in Kakuma, a refugee camp in northwest Kenya, and so I gave Rachel, a bunch of pictures of him and of Sudan that I took and, and gave, him, gave her some of this typography to sort of get the feel for it. And she put this together, which is what is the what. And this was a leather cover with, with three stamps um, on it, which uh, was very uh, labor-intensive and expensive. In it. And then when we shipped them, the ink rubbed everywhere. If anybody has seen this book, the blue ink rubbed on every single copy, which is really depressing. Um, but so the next run of it, we just went back to press, and the next run will look like this, which is more orange, and it's not all leather. It's sort of a cloth, a Weiblin, a fake cloth, and, uh, and none of it will rub uh, this time. But uh, we're going to probably change the color scheme again on the next one just because uh, we can. <laughs> and this is the last slide, which is... Uh, this is a, a poster that I did with Brian McMullen uh, which is about 60 short stories that I wrote over the years. And we arranged them in this radial design with about 200 drawings I did of men and women in World War II and, uh, and birds. And some of the birds, most of the birds have arms where there should be wings. <laughs> this is almost full, this is almost real size, with the poster. And we're going to shrink it a lot, and it'll be a wrapper for the next issue of McSweeney's. Um, this is like a little bit of a close-up. But um, Brian McMullen is a great designer out here and uh, helps with a lot of our stuff. So um, that's all I want to say. This is the new issue of McS the, what, what Michael was referring to is magnets. So these are three booklets that are bound into the spine <laughs> with magnets. <laughs> um, it, a couple years ago, we had it, we, we dared ourselves to do two issues, one with magnets and one entirely made of glass. <laughs> and we've done one. And uh, it's, uh, anyway, it's a good, good printer that put this together. Thanks for listening to me. I'm going to sit there and then we're going to talk. Right?
because it's getting a little late, um, we decided to go right to questions from the audience. And I have seven questions from the audience. I'm going to collect it from you guys. Okay? Question number one for Chip Kid. Seems like a smart fellow. You, <laughs> I like this question a lot. Why does Knopf include the label a novel on all its fiction covers? Is this really necessary? Isn't this really a case of labeling an apple an apple? Yes. <laughs> um, can I, 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 let me, permit me to expand on that, Ashley. You have to understand that all the language that you see on the front of a cover, at least that I work on, that's all determined by the editorial staff. I, you know, I, I'm not consulted on that kind of thing, but thank you uh, for thinking that I have that kind of sway. One thing that I will do is if I have a jacket sketch that I need to show to the editor-in-chief for approval and I'm worried that he won't like it or think it's too weird or too out there is that I will leave the word, uh, the phrase, a novel off. So when he looks at it, he'll say, do you think we should say a novel on this? <laughs> And totally redirects his focus. <laughs> you know, never mind that there's a disemboweled pig on the, on the front of this, you know, cutting edge new mid list novel that, you know, we're not saying it's fiction. So um, it's really not up to me. Um, um, I have a follow up question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no, um, it's do novels look different? Does fiction look different from nonfiction in some? Ineffable way. Are there codes that we're barely aware of that let us distinguish one from the other in a bookstore? I, I, I really don't know. I think, I think you have to take it as a case-by-case -case basis for, for books. I think one thing that I became very interested on very early on, um, and I apologize to Milton for this, was that when I first started working at Knopf in 1986, I became very enamored of the concept of illustrating fiction with photography as opposed to illustration. And I can't really honestly tell you why, other than that I, I just thought it would make the stories seem more real. So this was something that, that, that interested me that I then kind of pursued. Not that I didn't use any illustration at all, I, I did. but. Um, that, that's the only sort of distinction I think I can make. But, uh, but I've heard, actually, um, back in those days, people would, like editors would say, well, what is this? A, this is fiction, so what can this photograph have been taken of, in a way, right? Uh, yeah, although I think... Um, Not anymore. But by and large, it, you know, I, I, I don't want to, like, bore you with the whole thing, but the, the weird thing is, like, Sonny basically got there at the same time that I did, uh, Knopf being as... A revered and old institution as it is, was going through this huge upheaval at, the, at exactly the time that I got there. So here was I, this snot-nosed little kid from, from Lincoln Park, Pennsylvania. But Sonny got there at the same time to be editor-in-chief. He was a decidedly not snot-nosed person of great uh, cultural um, significance, and, and he was very worldly. But I think he very much was open to new ideas, and, and he wanted to take Knopf in a different direction visually. Um, that was the only really mean question, Chip. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, um, Milton, you, this is a good question. I you said that those blue Herman Hesse covers were sort of un-American looking. Mm -hmm. What's an American book jacket look like? No, oh, I don't know. No, really, though. No, it's funny because you were right, though. You were right. They, they, did, they did look kind of German in a way, or European at least. Well, I think in those cases, um, it, it was just the fact that they did, didn't fill the space, right? And that <laughs> they occupied about a third of the available space. And I suspect that our tendency now, particularly driven by the marketing department, is to make every inch of space as though it were a piece of property that had some inherent value work for its money. <laughs> So the, the nice thing about those jackets, of course, where they're so modest in their intention, they want to show a little picture, a little typography, with the presumption that the reader would be clever enough to figure it out for themselves. I, I couldn't tell you what a um, characteristic book jacket was, but I was very interested in what Chip said about photography and its relationship to illustration. 
which is that now that uh, illustration is uh, uh, totally manipulable, is that a word? One is able to do whatever one wants to do with a, an illustration. In fact, anyone can do it. In the old days, if you recall, that to modify an, a, a photograph required enormous skill by a retoucher and cutting out things and airbrushing them and so on. Now any 12-year-old can do that with a proper program on a dinky computer. So there is no longer this sense, I think on a general public perhaps, that there's any reality in a photograph. Or, so that idea of a photograph looking more real has pretty much vanished uh, from the culture. But nevertheless, there is this vestigial sense that because there was something real at one point that was photographed by someone and that it encapsulates a moment of time, that vestigial memory of what photography used to be, which it no longer is, still remains in people's minds as being therefore more realistic, as though we had any idea what reality it was. <laughs> so, um, uh, that gets a little bit into a question that I wanted to ask uh, Dave. Um, you're sort of in a way like a 21st century digital Luddite in a way, where you sort of have embraced the miracle of technology, but only up to a point, like the dial up and the core 4.1, et cetera. Um, do you ever like wonder what, what you'd be able to accomplish with, say, you know, a high speed internet hookup and <laughs> InDesign, you know, two I've million. tried InDesign. Oh, yeah, what do you think I don't, of that? I, don't, I can't make it work. Not it may, it, yeah. But my computer here, here. is like five years old and, and it doesn't have a whole lot of memory. Maybe it just needs more memory. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I just, but once I know that, we wouldn't exist, our company, our little tiny company, without desktop publishing. And this is what I learned in high school and Ready, Set, Go, and that's what made that possible. And um, So we're very thankful for it. But I can't keep up with the updates. Every time they want me to update any, I works fine as is, you know, and with our two fonts or whatever. And we don't, you know, we, uh, what we do, it's usually we decide on the materials very early on. The materials do about half the work for us because uh, we don't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be as successful with jackets, and we don't use jackets anymore because we're not, we don't, we're not good enough across the board. You know, we get lucky sometimes, but it's really about the materials. And so what we have, you know, sometimes it's just five words on the cover and we stamp it and that's it, you know? So uh, we don't need much, I guess. But there is a movement afoot among the younger folks uh, <laughs> on, our, on our staff that we're gonna get cork What's the six point something? I don't know, one of these things. But you can't find Quark yeah. anymore. I don't know where it is. But yeah, so I'd stick with Quark if I were you. Yeah. It's done you well up till now. So you can yeah. be the last Quark user out there. Someone asked in the audience, um, you know, you've done work, you've done a lot of work in publishing, obviously. That's what you're known for. But you've also done um, CDs and stuff like that. So you work in different media. Is there, is it, is there a difference in your mind about um, who the audience is, what the medium is? Uh, um, does a book have a certain bookishness to it that other objects do not and cannot? I don't know. No, for us, we're always trying to concentrate on the materiality, you know, the, to use art school word for you. Um, we want just people to keep whatever we do. And especially our monthly and some of these quarterlies, we know that you, people don't have necessarily enough time to read them as they come out, you know. But if you make it pretty enough, you put in enough time into the materials, you make it something that you want to keep, maybe you keep it on the shelf, maybe you'll find time later on to read it. It's just about, and I think that everybody here would agree that you're trying to like um, enhance the keepability of the words within, you mm -hmm. know, and so that they might get read, I think, more likely than some lesser le looking object that you would toss away. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Some assent from part of the audience, at least. There you go. Um, uh, Chip, this is a nicer question. Yeah, with a nice ending. Uh, I'll read you the entire thing. Chip, can you describe any rituals you follow? While uh, can you describe rituals you follow, if any, while reading, understanding, and creating the books you work on? Also, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, you can. <laughs> And I just might love you too. <laughs> um, 
the, the, the ritual is I, I, I read the manuscript, and if life is good, I will get the idea probably midway through. Uh, if it's not so good, I will finish the manuscript and not know what the hell to do. And then I will go and read something else. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's kind of like the way I do the crossword puzzle when it gets really hard on Friday and Saturday. It's like you start on it, and then you, you like work on it a bit, and then you just like put it aside, and then go do something else. And then a couple hours later when you come back to it, it's like, ah, a number of people anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> that took me fucking forever to figure out. It's the same way, I'm, I'm privileged <laughs> to work on a lot of books at once, both at Knopf and um, uh, freelance stuff and, and uh, so and the, the nice thing about books, as opposed to, say, uh, a magazine um, or, or, God forbid, a newspaper, is that the deadlines aren't so scary. And, and we, we have months built into the design process. And that's very, very helpful, because often it takes uh, a, a long time. And, and so, you, you know, every book is, a diff is its own thing. It's got its own sort of set of... Uh, Goals. You're trying to figure out what the what the author is trying to do. Um, you know, thinking about uh, you know, it's, it's, it's if it's a thriller, how can I make a thriller look you know more interesting than a thriller normally looks? All this kind of stuff. It's 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 a very intuitive process. Mill, do you have any rituals that you use in order to translate, figure out what form a book should take in terms of its design? Well, it's interesting because Chip describes a process. I think that everybody uh, has found. Uh, useful to them, which is to say that the imagination is not uh, subject to instructions from the will. So you have to withdraw uh, your demand. I mean, you say, I'm going to get it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to forget it. What really happens is when you accept your intuition, is you have to be in a kind of passive state, and it sort of checks in. And the other thing that affects that is your belief that it will happen. Of course, if you do believe it, it does happen. If you don't, you're out of luck. So. <laughs> um, here's a uh, uh, demographically based question. Um, why do you guys, um, I'm paraphrasing here, suppose there are fo so few female graphic designers, or at least so few female superstar quote unquote graphic designers, it seems for every Paula Cher, who's one of my partners, there are at least five or more male superstars, several of whom are on stage now, is there glass ceiling and graphic design? Let me quote Larry Summers on this, because <laughs> he had a very astute observation. And he's at, he went to Harvard. Smart guy. No, just kidding. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, I mean, is there um, a question from the audience? What, um, what, um, I think there's a real reason for it, and I don't think it's terribly complicated, and I think it is structural. The reason is that women get pregnant, have children, and go home and take care of their children. And those essential years that the, uh, men are building their careers and becoming visible are basically denied to women who choose to be at home. I don't know how you overcome this issue, because there is no substitute for a mother raising a child. And I think mothers suffer because of this if, in fact, their objectives is to have a big career. Because at the middle of the time, when they should be building that career and being in the world and being visible, they are home taking care of the kid. And uh, unless something very dramatic happens to the nature of human experience, that's never going to change. Although I would say, um, interestingly, interesting to this particular point, um, some of the most well-known female designers that I could name actually made their names either early on or throughout their career doing book covers. You know, uh, and that's uh, uh, Louise Feely, Karen Goldberg, Paula Scher did a bit more of her share, and then um, the, a lot of uh, uh, the staff at Knopf, whether it's uh, Carol Devine Carson or uh, yeah, Abby I, or I, uh, I just, Barbara I, DeWilding. I yeah. don't know. I mean, most of the people I went to school with in to study design were women. When I taught at School of Visual Arts, a good three quarters of my class were women. 
We've got a bunch, uh, many brilliantly talented women on staff who some of their work I showed tonight, I don't, I don't know what to say. We're trying. Well, at least the moderator should be a woman next time, I'd say. <laughs> now, it's important to also observe that 60 or 65% of the field is not women, but the real question is, why do they not ascend to the privilege there? Is that men do? And I, I do think, fundamentally, it's because that opportunity for visibility is denied most women because they've made a choice in their life about having a family and raising that family. There's all kinds of ways of working around that issue with daycare and nannies. None of them are good solutions. I, 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 uh, but the, with the beauty of desktop publishing and such, my wife and I had a one-year-old. Uh, we split the time at home and uh, work at home, and that split it down the middle, it seems to work. I don't know, I think, uh, uh, I don't know. Is it, is it like it in New York where you gotta, I don't know, maybe it's different here well, than where we are. <laughs> uh, I didn't, wasn't aware that there was any discrepancy, but I, I, that's all news to me. I don't, I, uh, but uh, let's move on. No, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right away. Hey, by the way, Michael Kupperman, that's the artist who I couldn't remember his name ah, before. Ah. He is incredible. He's one of the greats. Michael Kupperman. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is a more general question uh, for any of you guys. What suggestions would you have for a, uh, a graphic designer who specifically wants to get into book cover or book design? Try something else. <laughs> don't do it. Your advice, no. Is that correct? Seriously? I don't need the competition. <laughs> Go for it. I don't know. I'm sorry. I, sh I shouldn't have jumped in. Does it take a special sensibility, do you think? I mean, do, what, what, what else do you need to be good at, actually? It's just not, typo it's not simply being a good typographer. You need to be you know. good at being poor. <laughs> um, you need to love to read. And you need to um, love to read and be poor. I don't know how else to say it. The, the, the really kind of sweet, corny thing about being in publishing is that I have found, honest to God, that people are in it because they love it, and they love books, and they love to read, and they want to be involved in it, and they, and they want to help, you know, design and copy edit and whatever it is they want to do, be, you know, especially in New York. I don't know how anybody does it. I really don't, because you, you've got to really you got to love it, and you know the, these kids that, that that are coming up that want to do it. I just I just say good luck. I mean, you've got to have the passion, and but it's so insanely expensive to live here. You know, on these crazy salaries, and more power to them. I I, I just don't know. You've got to really have a passion for it. Hmm. So thus it is always. I think the um the last question is uh, uh, I'll direct each of you in turn, and I think this is really an interesting one. Um, are there any books that you can think of, either f a recent one or from any time in the faraway past, that you would fantasize about designing a cover or illustrating for or redesigning the book? Can you talk about um, what a dream project like that would be, Dave, to start with you? Uh, I, I, Saul Bellow's work, is he's my favorite writer. I would love a chance if they reissued his paperbacks or something like that. I would jump on that and devote everything I had to that, I think. I, his work, his paperbacks, and have you done any of those, Milton? No? Um, <laughs> but his, his, all the editions are all over the map, and I think that if there were a uniform thing, and um, that's what I, would, I guess I would love to do here, here at Nabokov, um, and I love your Penin cover, by the way, but um, yeah, one of those two guys. I think, you know, to be able to work with a hero like that would be something and make a series out of it. Particularly once they've safely passed away and can't interfere. Yes, exactly. It makes them all the more appealing. Now, uh, the first edition of uh, Adventures of Augie Marsh has beautiful Futura on it. Yeah. Just beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I'd throw that out. Uh, if you can imagine. Uh, Chip, yours? Um, my stock, very uninteresting answer is J.D. Salinger, except that's a classic case where um, the, those jackets really, frankly, aren't very good, but they've become so iconic because, of, because the stories are so iconic, it would be a, a deep mistake to, to, um, to change them. So 
I, I've been so blessed. I mean, I've done covers for, for so many writers that I, that I deeply love. The, on, the only two, ironically, that are at Knopf that I don't work on because uh, Carol Carson works on them are Laurie Moore and um, Alice Monroe. And they're, you know, they're, they're two of the single best living writers working today. Is this the last question? Yes. Yeah, so All right. I just want to do my Tonight Show moment here real quickly. <laughs> These two men on either side of me are true heroes to New York. Milton Glaser gave New York I Heart New York, which he gave it to them. And that's an a major, major amazing thing. Dave Eggers, besides everything else he's done, the 826 Writing Clinic in, I don't know what you call it, <laughs> in Brooklyn. And they're, they're sprouting up in all these cities, in, in San Francisco and where it started. It's a truly just, it's, it'll make you believe that good can exist again when you go there. <laughs> it's, it's so amazing that he did that. You should all go to, to Brooklyn and you know, look it up on the web. It's, it's incredible. And it's, it's true community outreach in the best possible sense of people teaching kids to, to read and to write. And anyway, I just wanted to say that. It's well, so Milton, finally, from, uh, <laughs> well, fr from the, the depth of your experience, so long and so substantial and so inexhaustible, so is there long, some project, so long, some so fantasy long. project that you've been denied these many years? No, I haven't been denied anything. Uh, <laughs> my parents came from uh, Transylvania. They spoke Hungarian at home very often when they didn't want me to understand anything. And the only phrase that I remember out of my childhood in Hungarian was Ojalneki, which means let him have it. <laughs> so I have been denied nothing. Um, <laughs> oh, I, I really believe that, though, I have to say. And it is so nice being here this evening with uh, lovers of literature and the conversation and the conveying ideas to others because there is nothing more breathtaking than the act of conceptualizing something in your mind which is truly metaphysical and then seeing that transformed into a material object. The joy of what we do is taking something that exists only as an idea and making it real, if we, again, can call that reality. But I actually, I was so moved by a book this year that I read um, called The Omnivore's Dilemma. I hope some of you have read that by Michael Pollan, well, Pollan, which uh, is a book basically about issues of sustainability and what has happened in the United States, that I, I would love for the opportunity to do that book, only to dramatize it sufficiently to make it more attractive for people to buy, although it, it's quite nice. But I would recommend to everybody in this audience that they buy a copy of that book immediately, and you will not be able to stop reading it and realize what has happened to this country in recent years. And. Um, it will uh, develop a great sense of indignation on your part and also a sense of the reality of the life we are now living. So that would be something I'd love to be able to work on, although this is very unlikely. <laughs> you never can tell. Um, I'd like to thank our uh, three panelists, Dave Eggers, Chip Kidd, Milton Glaser. <laughs> And to uh, thank all of you for being such a good audience and uh, to invite you. you to join us in the lobby for a um, Thanks, Michael. Afterwards. Thank you, Michael Beirut. You're fantastic.